Newfoundland has changed a lot since I left here. New technology, better ways of doing things, and more of an understanding of how to manage our resources. It's a dramatic island. The landscape is stark and violent. The film you're going to see now is, uh, is a film that was made in 1949 on the eve of Newfoundland's confederation with the rest of Canada. And it cut the flavor of the island in that period of change. Some of the traditional ways of life have gone now. Maybe the new ways are better, maybe not. There was hardship, but there was also a kind of wild, romantic strength, too. So the Newfoundland you'll see on the film is not the Newfoundland of today, but some of it is still here. History doesn't change, it just goes on. The character is still here, and the sea doesn't change. Newfoundland, where great airships roar across the runways at Gander Field, gateway to the Western world, where iron ore and lead and zinc are hauled from the earth at Bell Island and Buchan, where the log booms move on the Humber and the exploits, and the whirling machinery of Cornerbrook and Grand Falls convert forest wealth for the marts of commerce, where the products of the sea are packed in the busy factories of St. John's and where the gentle, courageous dogs who bear the island's name are bred. All these are part of Newfoundland. But this sea-circled province has a deeper character, a distinction that lies in the lives of the men and women who people her rocky coasts, in the struggle to travel over the trackless barrens, and most of all, in the grim, romantic efforts to hunt the creatures of the sea. Clinging to the rocks near the fishing grounds from which they take their livelihood are the little outports, villages whose names come from incidents long past. Damnable Bay, Pinch Gut Tickle, Harbor My God and Run By Guess, Spy Hole and Maggoty Cove, Hearts Content. Sometimes by roads, sometimes only by the sea, the villages cleave to the shore along the north, the south, the east and the west. The ground is stubbornly unfertile, yet somehow they manage to reap a hard-won harvest from the soil. Survival of the fittest is a rule that bred this sturdy race. They live with the ocean at their door. Every family owns a boat, either large or small. For without a boat, life in a Newfoundland outport would be impossible.
they looked to the sea for their very existence. In early summer, the ocean brings millions of little fish called capelin close to the shore. These capelins swarm in the shallows, and a fisherman can take a hundred or more with a single toss of his cast net. Fishermen with a capelin seine surround a whole school at one time. These little fish are eaten, either dried or fresh, but the largest part of the catch is used for bait. But it is the inshore cod fishery that supplies most of the necessities of life. Setting out in little boats, just as their fathers and grandfathers did before them, the men head for the cod traps. Inshore fishing is often a family affair, with father, son and brother using methods that change little from generation to generation. Surrounding the villages are the fish flakes. These are wooden platforms on which the cod, after they have been cleaned and salted, are spread out in the sun to dry. A man of the outports is a jack of all trades, fisherman, farmer, carpenter, and mechanic. But self-reliant as they are, there is still a human need for contact with the outside world. The approach of the coastal steamer carrying mail and supplies is an important event. For most of the outports, it is the only direct link with city shops and warehouses, and people flock to the landing stage. The crowds on the wharf come from the neighboring villages as well. Villages whose harbors are too small or too shallow to be ports of call on the steamer's trip. The ships move on as soon as the cargo has been discharged. The steamers in the coastal service, the Northern Ranger, the Kyle, the Burgio, Glencoe, Springdale and Bacalow, circle the island from the time that spring clears the ice from the harbors until they freeze up in the fall. The departure of the sealing fleet in early spring is an event that recalls adventurous tales of long ago. 
Among the crowds who gather to watch the ships set forth on their month-long hunt are old-timers who remember the names of wooden vessels like the Falcon, the Lion and the Southern Cross. Ships that sailed out of the harbor and never saw the lights of St. John's again. Their epitaph, an entry in a book that reads, Lost with all hands. Steaming toward the harbor mouth, past the houses on the battery, the hopes and fears of many families go with the Algerine and the Terra Nova as they put out to sea. Winter in the northern outports means an end to the visits of the coastal steamers, a cutting off of all roads by the hard, wind-packed snow. Then dog teams take over the burden of travel and transportation. From morning till night, the ice-locked harbors of centers like St. Anthony are parking lots for dozens of dog teams and comatics, as the sleighs are called. The dogs are used to haul many different loads. Fresh water from the nearest stream. Wood, which must often be hauled 10 miles to the village. Or perhaps a harp seal killed on the shore ice. Even the Grenfell doctor makes his rounds by dog team. To control direction, the driver pulls on the comatic and calls out command. The strange, uncharted highways have a traffic all their own with the swift dogs traveling a route that would be impossible for any ordinary vehicle. The neat pattern of a fan hitch can be converted to chaos if the dogs decide to pass on different sides of an obstacle. On downgrades, there is danger that the comatic may slide into the heels of the team. Then the driver drops the drug, a heavy chain that falls beneath the runners and acts as a brake. Arriving at a house with only the tips of a fence showing above the snow, the doctor becomes a professional man again. A visit may mean an hour-long examination of a patient or just a quick checkup on a post-operative case. But even the briefest stop is time enough for trouble to start.
Only the prompt action of the doctor saved the leader from death. The rebellious dogs were out to kill the bully who tyrannized them, stealing their share of food. Unraveling the traces after a fight is a job that needs skill and patience. But the dogs are not so patient. Even the wounded leader scorns the gentle attentions of his mate. Any delay sets them into a frenzy of barking. All they want is to get going. Someday, there may be broad highways linking the main towns. But in the tiny hamlets, up along the straits and around White Bay, it will still be fleet-footed mongrel dogs who carry doctor and fisherman, merchant and child, over the frozen barrens. In the days when Moby Dick, the fabulous white sperm whale, roamed the waters of the Orient, his cousin, the giant finback, was described as being gifted with such wondrous power and velocity in swimming as to defy all pursuit by man. But today, in Newfoundland waters, whaling captains and their crews set out with modern weapons to hunt these 80-ton leviathans. Whale well over there. Keep it port a little. Port a little, sir. As soon as the whale is sighted, the ship's course is altered and the chase is on. Whether it ends in a kill or in escape for the whale, the hunt goes on relentlessly day after day. Starboard. Starboard, sir. Starboard around. Starboard, sir. Starboard. Starboard over. Starboard over. Steady around. Steady. Even when a whale is well within range, the captain will not fire unless he is almost sure of a kill. During the four-hour watch, the two sailors on duty change places every hour. The spotter from the crow's nest takes over the wheel and the helmsman mounts to the lookout's post. Just keep a starboard. Starboard, sir. S steady like that. Steady. Starboard, sir. Starboard. 
give her half speed. Half speed, dear. Port! Over in the sun! Port! Hard over, Port. In, right there in the sun. Over in the sun! Hold him a bit, Port. Hold him. Come over. Come over. Turn right over, Port! Port over! He's coming up! He's coming up! Starboard! Starboard! Starboard around! Coming up! Starboard around! Come forward a bit. Forward a bit. Steady. Steady. Starboard. Starboard, sir. When the death struggle is over and the whale is secured alongside, an air hose is jabbed into its belly and the whale is pumped with air to keep it afloat. like the Olaf Olsen is simply a killer ship. The captain will radio the position of the dead whale to another ship, which will tow it to Williamsport for processing. Marked by a red flag, the whale is cast adrift to wait for the tow boat. The sight and smell of the whale's carcass is a signal for the approach of the killers, small, fierce whales who prey on their larger brethren. nearly four centuries, fishing was virtually the only industry in Newfoundland. It was the abundance of cod that brought the first settlers to the island, and their descendants still roam the Grand Banks to fill their ships with fish for the markets of the world.
draggers are gradually replacing traditional methods of bank fishing. These larger vessels drag a huge net along the ocean floor. The mouth of the trawl is held open by heavy wooden otter doors. Every hour when the net is hauled in, the otter doors are the first to come aboard, one at the stern and one at the bow. When John Cabot returned to England after his first voyage to Newfoundland, he told of waters teeming with fish, and later, his son Sebastian reported the cod to be so numerous that they stared our ships. The great loads of fish that spill onto the decks of modern vessels show that they spoke truly. But even as the sea remains bountiful, it also remains cruel. The gales of the North Atlantic have not mellowed with the centuries. The misty outline of Cape Race has been a symbol of safe return for scores of storm-ravaged vessels. Men who, with faith in Almighty God, guide their ships toward a calmer sea, have rightfully inherited all that is finest of the mariner's wisdom and skill. The proud annals of His Majesty's Navy are filled with tales in which seamen from Newfoundland played a heroic part. Many of the sailors who outfought and outsailed the Spanish Armada were veteran fishermen from the Newfound Isle. There is tradition, too, in the lives of those who keep the lights along the shore. At dusk, when Frank Cantwell switches on the great lamp of the Cape Spear light, he's following a pattern set by his great-grandfather more than a hundred years ago. And the message has not changed. One. Two, three, Cape Spear ahead. Uncounted numbers of those who live in peril on the sea have strained aching eyes through the fog for a glimpse of that signal. The melancholy hail and reply 
echo across dangerous waters. All along the coast, other lights are leading other captains to a safe haven or guiding them out of the harbor toward the open sea. There is an entry in an ancient record book in England, August 10th, 1497, to John Cabot, him that found the new isle, 10 pounds. The mist-shrouded island that John Cabot sighted so long ago has burnished history with the character of her people, and the name of the newfound land will gleam through its outward grayness as long as the seas and the centuries roll on.